All right, welcome everyone uh, to High Rounds, uh, this uh, newest, latest edition. Uh, we're very uh, pleased to have Dr. Monica Gandhi here today to uh, present a talk uh, today about lessons for COVID-19 from HIV, uh, history and global equity. Uh, and very brief introduction about uh, Dr. Uh, Gandhi. Um, she's an infectious disease doctor, uh, professor of medicine and associate chief uh, in the division of HIV, infectious diseases and global medicine at the uh, UCSF. Uh, she is also the director of uh, the UCSF Center for AIDS Research um, and the medical director of the HIV clinic there, uh, Ward 86, well known to everyone uh, at San Francisco uh, General Hospital. Uh, her research focuses on HIV in women and adherence measurement in HIV treatment and prevention, uh, and most recently on how to mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic. I think the last time she was here, she gave a talk about, if I remember, a, a, a antiretroviral, I think, adherence in looking at hair sample, if I remember right. Yeah. So we're very glad to have her back. Uh, she was recently at CROI, uh, is, I think many of some people here in the audience uh, as well and did an excellent presentation uh, talking about uh, their experience on CAB Rilpivirine. Uh, that's probably another topic altogether. We can uh, perhaps have her come back. So, uh, so let's give our, our welcome to uh, Dr. Monica Gandhi. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. And there was a tension between doing an ART talk and kind of a global talk. And I was told um, to focus on this because I know this is a wide audience. Um, so we're going to talk today about, oh, sorry. Point it that way. <laughs> sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, you got it. Thank you so much. So we're going to talk today about kind of the history of COVID and, and HIV. There's been a lot of interest in this. Global COVID vaccines and variants, the current state of the COVID pandemic, going back to the current state of the HIV pandemic, pandemic preparedness, and some discussion on global equity because we saw echoes of what happened during ART access with what happened with COVID vaccines. So to think about the history, the reason that everyone you know, was concerned that essentially we are going to be in an era of pandemics is that we are doing things in with humans that interfere with the animal world and with interfere with the planet. So global warming will bring pathogens to new niches, which will expose them to new hosts. Our interactions with animals are very uh, complicated. Changes in agriculture have brought new crops and new pests together. We encroach on animal habitats. We're very crowded. Urbanization, uh, West Nile virus came over on a ship, like all of this movement here and fro. And so this is, if this is the era we're in, then how do we combat this era? And when we think about what happened with SARS-CoV-2, this was not the first time that a coronavirus caused severe disease in our population. Actually, probably the first time may have been OC43, which was a common cold coronavirus now, but it may have caused the Russian flu in 1889 and then settled down into a mild um, coronavirus. And then the second one in our memory, of course, was SARS. And this was 2002, 2003. It was um, very, very uh, high fatality rate, 8,100 cases, but 774 deaths of coronavirus that caused this severe acute respiratory syndrome. And it came out of the horseshoe bat, went through palm civets, and then came into human populations. But it was limited. It basically was the late 2002, early 2003. And then the second one was Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And this was 2012. Um, and it actually, there were just two cases last year. So it's very, very low level, but it's not completely gone. But it is 2,494 cases, 858 deaths. And it also came from the bat through the dromedary and then into humans, but a very limited uh, coronavirus. And then we all know this by heart because we've been living this. SARS-CoV-2, December 31st, 2019, was first shared with the WHO that there was this case of a coronavirus, cases of coronavirus causing severe disease, didn't know it was coronavirus until a week later when it was sequenced to be such. And then by March 11th, 2020, the WHO declared this a pandemic. And um, we have been really the epicenter of the pandemic. We've had a very polarized and 
um, complicated response in the United States, which has been really tragic to see and will affect all of us, I think, going forward as people who work in infectious diseases. And we're at around 6.71 million deaths from this coronavirus worldwide. Uh, and so what about HIV? Let's now go to the history of HIV and then bring them both back together. HIV, of course, is a retrovirus, but specifically it's called a lentivirus because lenta means slow, slow progression. It, uh, that suffix um, uh, means that it's a slow progression from getting the infection to actually getting ill. And we know where it came from because it had to have come from simian, simian immunodeficiency viruses because all primates live with their own simian immunodeficiency viruses to greater or lesser degrees, as you, as you all know. And so the questions become, where did it, how, where, which uh, um, primate, how did it enter from primates into humans, and when did that crossover event occur? And actually, there was more than one crossover event because there's HIV-1 as the major type of HIV. In fact, group M HIV-1 causes 90% of all infections worldwide. And then there's HIV-2 that's m m uh, more limited to West African countries, uh, unfortunately, that colonize West Africa. But there were different crossover events. The one that's HIV-1 group M is related to the SIV strain in chimpanzees. And the one from HIV-2 is related to the SIV strain in Sudi Mangabees. So the first you know, theory and it reminds me of what's going on right now with COVID, is everyone's putting theories forward about how HIV entered human populations. This was, I mean, Dr. Fauci actually said at Croy, give us 18 years, because it took a long time to figure out, give us more time than this, how, HIV, how COVID entered human populations, because it took a long time to start speculating on how HIV came into human populations. Someone wrote a whole book on it. Edward Hooper wrote a whole book called The River in 1999, where he thought that HIV entered human populations through the polio vaccination campaign. And the theory was, and this is um, was later not shown to be true, but the theory was that, of course, Sabin was making the oral polio vaccine. Salk was making the inactivated vaccine. The NIH called a meeting in 1957 looking at Sabin's vaccine and another oral polio vaccine made by Hilary Kaprowski. And that other oral polio vaccine didn't work as well as Sabin's vaccine. And the NIH said, you know, don't give it out. But Dr. Kaprowski actually did give it out to about a million people in what's now called, what was then called Belgium controlled um, uh, Congo and other places in Belgium controlled Africa. A million doses of this vaccine given out. It happened to be grown in primate cells in African green monkey kidney cells. And so the question that Edward Hooper propounded in this entire book was that it was that vaccination campaign that led of the entrance to HIV into human populations. Wasn't the right primate, wasn't the right area, wasn't the right timing. So this is not the current theory about how HIV entered human populations. The theory is unfortunately this practice of the bushmeat trade of essentially hunting, slaughtering, and eating primates for food. And it was that entrance of that practice of our exposure to primates, hunters' exposure to primates, that led to enter of HIV into human populations. And then you need one of the strains to be human to human transmitted efficiently, and then it will spread. And so this is the this is the how of how HIV came into human populations. And um, and and then the next question is when did HIV enter human populations? And Dr. Fauci talked about these papers at his talk at Croy, but the first theory was um, from from you here, uh, from 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 all of us here in in the United States, that this idea was that we maybe thought it entered around the year 1930s. And where did that come from? So Beatrice Hahn published a paper in Science in the year 2000, where there were 1,200 specimens found from what what is now known um, as the Democratic Republic of Congo, and of these 1,200 specimens found up in a fridge in um, in, uh, in UW that they had collected from uh, DRC, one of them had HIV in it. And so they called that strain the Zyre 59 strain and then did phylogenetic analysis and said, okay, I'm publishing this around 1999. How far is this Zyre 59 strain from what's in human populations now? How far is it from the SIV strain in chimpanzees? And they estimated that, human, that this HIV came into human populations around the 1930s. 
that's not the latest theory because another strain was found. And so this is a paper by Michael Warby that was published in Nature in 2008. And another strain was found called the DRC60 strain from a adult female in Kinshasa. And DRC60 and Zyre 59 didn't look close enough together that HIV entered human populations in the 30s. And the current theory is that it crossed over into humans around the turn of the 20th century, around 1908 actually, from 1884 to 1924. And that's where we stand. That's when we think HIV came into human populations. That's the last sample found and that's where we are. And then what happened? Well, if it was around in 1908, why didn't we see outbreaks before this? Because it was low level, because the, the, place, the places where it entered, which is in West Africa, were not disrupted enough. And what caused disruption in West Africa? Colonialism. What happened with colonialism of West Africa is that cities grew, cities grew much larger. Kinshasa by the 1950s was over 100,000 people. Disruption occurred. The sex trade was established, movement occurred, and the conditions for spread were set up in the second half of the 20th century. And then what had to happen is that the virus came over from West to Eastern Africa, and then you really had conditions for spread. Low late rates of circumcision in East Africa, uh, low status of women, truck drivers going multiple places, a very active sex trade. And by 1986, 85% of sex workers in Nairobi were infected. And then it went down to Sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa. And here is the map of HIV in the 1980s as it starts making its way from East down to South Africa. And then here's the map in 1995. East and Southern Africa, still really high prevalent regions for HIV. Here's the map in 2005 with the breakdown of the former Soviet Union spread into East Af Eastern Europe and areas uh, there because of um, uh, opiate use and people who use um, injection drugs. And then here is the map today. Here's where we stand. 38.4 million people living with HIV worldwide. Again, still of the higher prevalence in East and uh, Southern Africa and major disruptions that occurred during COVID-19 uh, to, to lead to where we are right now. So, okay, sorry. It's, but you made it work last time. Uh, so this is, this is where we are in the, in the world right now. And do we know exactly how COVID entered human populations? It's it going to be an active process. It likely has something to do with, with the wet markets and, and our treatment of animals. And this will take time. And, and I really um, like Dr. Fauci's line at Croy that this will take time to figure out the exact crossover event. This was a new pandemic. Okay, so let's turn back to COVID and then we'll go back to HIV and let's talk about global COVID vaccines. So we're actually in an era where we have four COVID vaccines in this country, but there are uh, nine, except for Sputnik V, which politically hasn't been approved actually. Um, there are actually nine, vac eight vaccines that are approved by the World Health Organization on their guidelines. And if you look at the top six, they all involve the spike protein in some way. And the bottom three are all whole inactivated viruses that have been that have been killed. And so what is the design of these different vaccines? Well, the ones involved the spike protein, of course, the spike protein is the piece of that virus that sticks out from the virus and sticks uh, closely to the host cell. This particular um, portion of the virus has been very quick to change because the virus wants to make more copies of itself and it's become more and more transmissible with time by alterations and mutations in the spike protein. And there are three major types of vaccines that involve the spike protein. This was novel to have mRNA vaccines, but that not that novel in the sense that I just told you about MERS. Actually, the mRNA vaccines were designed in the context of MERS. So when people ask, it's been actually more than 10 years where this technology has been developed. We just didn't need it for MERS. mRNA, of course, mRNA yeah, you put in a lipid bilayer, inject, and then and then you yourself make um, the the protein by translating that mRNA 
and then you can have high levels of protein or raise a strong immune response. That's Pfizer and Moderna. And then three types of vaccines that are DNA inside an adenovirus. That's Johnson & Johnson, um, Sputnik V, and AstraZeneca. And then we do have one vaccine in this country, which is just that old traditional design of a protein with an adjuvant, and that's the Novavax vaccine. And we know that the vaccine, we know we work in HIV. We know that the immune system is not just antibodies. We know that the vaccines raise strong T and B cell immunity. And actually T cells and TH1 cells specifically um, uh, are, the, are the cells that we, CD4 cells with TH1 are really the cells that, that are the main cells that fight the virus. And so all of these vaccines raise T cells and then they raise B cells too and, and B cells aided by T cells will make more antibodies against the virus if they see it in the future. And how do we know that all these vaccines produce T cells? Because we never measured T cell immunity with the 1963 measles vaccine because we're in the modern era and because all of the trials that looked at these vaccines, this is column four here, in phase one and two studies measured strong T cell immunity that was generated by these vaccines uh, in the individuals, uh, in macaques and in all the phase one, two studies. And so because of that, because T cells protect um, humans against severe disease, the protection in the original clinical trials of all these vaccines against severe disease was very high, approached 100% against COVID hospitalizations and deaths. And then the variants happened and, and the protection went down, but not necessarily always against severe disease. The three whole inactivated viruses are interesting because there's been a lot raised about them. Um, the top product, Covaxin, is in India. Sinopharm, Sinopharm and Sinovac are in China, but they actually distributed it um, to many places in Latin America and Africa. We're just actually starting to get data that these the, the party line had been these vaccines don't work that well, but we're getting some very good data that these vaccines probably actually worked very well, especially in terms of generating T cell immunity, though three doses of Sinopharm and Sinovac are required. So T cells and B cells are important when we think about COVID vaccine reactivity, because as the spike protein is changed, as antibodies raised by the vaccines haven't worked as well, because there's been so many mutations across the spike protein, T cell immunity generated by the vaccines has remained intact across all the variants, multiple papers, so many of them from La Jolla Institute of Immunology uh, here in San Diego, just amazing work done by this institute about how T cell immunity raised by the vaccines cover any variant from alpha to Omicron because the T cell immunity is so broad of a repertoire across the spike protein that those mutations cannot combat the broadness of uh, and, the, and the sort of blanket coverage of the T cell immunity. And then a lot of uh, data also, again, from here um, in San Diego of how memory B cells are generated by the vaccines. But importantly, if you see a variant in the future, a subvariant in the future, you see XBB 1.5, that the antibodies produced by the B cells are adapted towards the subvariant they see. You don't produce antibodies that are directed against the ancestral strain. You direct antibodies against, um, generated antibodies against what you see in front of you. That's adaptive immunity. And so these variants have emerged. Obviously, the alpha and delta were the ones that went worldwide. Beta and gamma ended up staying more regionally where they were discovered. And the Omicron variant was the most transmissible in all of its forms. Um, and, and it may have been similar to what happened with the 1918 influenza pandemic with the third wave of infection in the sense that Though it was extremely transmissible, there was less virulence in terms of its ability to attack lung cells. Didn't mean it wasn't very virulent, for example, in older people. So it also caused a massive amount of natural infection. There are estimates from Seattle, the IHME, that about 89% of the population has seen Omicron or one of its forms. And so at this point, um, the US data as of yesterday shows that this is from the NIH Cerro Hub that 99.99% .99 of us here in the US have anti-spike antibodies, either from the vaccine or from natural infection, because natural infection can of course give anti-spike antibody. And 89.4% of Americans have anti-nucleocapsid antibody, which of course is only generated if you've seen the virus. This is the degree of population immunity 
we have in the United States at this point. And I do think that Omicron seemed to show the power of hybrid immunity, um, uh, meaning the WHO actually uh, did an analysis, uh, commissioned a meta-analysis of multiple studies that was published on January 18th, 2023 in The Lancet that looked at what's your strongest form of protection against both infection, hospitalization, and death. And it seems to be getting both the vaccine and infection. Why? Pretty simple. Infection generates IgA, which is the mucosal antibody up in your nose, but intramuscular vaccines don't generate IgA very well. And the vaccines generate T and B cell immunity very well. So you have protection against severe disease down here from the T and B cell immunity, and you have the mucosal immunity from the infection itself. Until we get to a nasal vaccine, the best way to get you know, mucosal immunity is actually natural infection. And Dr. Fauci wrote a piece on this about a month ago. So it really is this protection, multiple, multiple studies of hybrid immunity that's been the most protective against Omicron. And the thing about Omicron is, yes, it can be less virulent, but if everyone in the world gets it, if you have no immunity, it can cause a lot of disease, clearly. And so this is, I think, a very important graph because this was Omicron BA1, the first subvariant that appeared. And you can see that those who were vaccinated were much more protected against hospitalization than those who were unvaccinated. By the time we got to March, so many people had seen the virus, so many people had seen these emerging subvariants that the rates of hospitalization and those unvaccinated and vaccinated approached each other because of all the natural immunity. And that's where we are within this country with the degree of natural immunity. And then who remains at risk for severe disease in the world after vaccination? This is a really important study from The Lancet. This is one of my favorite studies from COVID because it essentially looked at 30 million people across the UK who had, looked, who had received two doses of the vaccine and four predictors of needing a third dose, of needing probably ongoing boosters. Older age, it was a, over 80 in this particular analysis, but older age, we have to decide what that age is. Every country's deciding for themselves. Um, uh, having chronic renal insufficiency, having five or more comorbidities, or being on immunosuppressants. Multiple, uh, repeated boosters will be necessary for those populations. And, um, and uh, I wrote a piece in the Lancet ID about, about who needs the boosters. So where are we with the current epidemiology of COVID? And then let's go back to HIV. We are at this state in the United States. We are with these kind of three major waves and then all of the subvariants and their ups and downs. And the public health emergency will end in this country on May 11th, 2023. The WHO on March 30th, 2022, actually laid out a plan to emerge from the emergency phase of the pandemic. And what their plan was, was accounted for all variant types. What if we stay where we are, stay with Omicron and its subvariants? The essentially, they called that the base scenario and said that older people will need boosting on an ongoing basis. Vulnerable and older people, likely every winter in the region of the winter, will need a boost going into those winter months. Second scenario, if we got somehow a milder variant, everyone would be naturally boosted, actually. And the third scenario is if we get a worse variant. And if that happens, likely from nature or from another source, then we would all need ongoing vaccination, meaning even young people would need a boost um, going into the winter. And then let's end with endemicity. Uh, the, the concept of endemicity is that we can't eradicate this virus. And that um, is an unfortunate fact, but there are really four phases in infectious disease epidemiology of trying to get where you want to get to a virus. And most pathogens are at control. There are very few pathogens, actually only two, right, that have been eradicated worldwide. Those are rinderpest in cattle, and that was eradicated by killing all the cattle. We're not going to do that. And then the second one is smallpox. And what were the features? Smallpox, by the way, is not extinct. Smallpox would be extinct if we had destroyed the lab supplies. So what are the, what are the features of a pathogen that make it eradicable? Smallpox had all four. COVID-19 does not have any of these. One was that no animal reservoirs. So why is polio next on the list for eradication, not because it doesn't actually have any animal reservoirs, but it only has primate reservoirs. And we were able to eradicate uh, um, polio um, type two. Second is 
smallpox only look like itself. And COVID-19 has a lot of features that overlap with other respiratory pathogens. Short period of infectiousness, small uh, COVID can be um, even when pre-symptomatic passed on. And then once you got smallpox or got the vaccine, you were immune for life, including sterilizing immunity. We actually saw this in the Genius vaccine for monkeypox, right? It wasn't just the vaccine, but natural immunity that led to that global outbreak coming down after um, infection. So COVID-19 does not have any of those features. And though we have an excellent vaccine, it is to prevent severe disease. And we don't have a nasal or a sterilizing immunity vaccine. Monica, can I stop you for a quick second? There was a question. Um, oh, yeah. Ask your, questions. Your last ask. slide about, can you comment on that line that said, my addition, consider whole virus oh. vaccine? <laughs> well, you know, this is, I know this is my addition, but fundamentally, um, we keep on, we're boosting with, with, a, with a spike protein vaccine. In our country, um, we happen to have only vaccines that are directed against the spike protein, Novavax, Moderna, uh, Pfizer, and, um, and um, Johnson & Johnson. And actually, India has done profoundly well um, after the Delta variant, and they have a whole virus vaccine. Again, the data out of China hasn't been as clear, but Hong Kong actually used the Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccine. And there was just a really nice um, Lancet piece two weeks ago showing that vaccine seems to work well. If you're going to have variant after variant, it'd be nice to show the body for a booster, the whole virus. So um, I've been very interested in whole virus vaccines. I actually was in India this summer and I got the Covaxin vaccine as my booster. Um, and I, I like the idea of showing us the whole virus. There are seven centers funded by the NIH that are working at whole virus vaccines. But my claim is, and I know I'm biased because I'm Indian American, but we have one. They've actually been submitting um, to the FDA saying, give us Covaxin, let us have Covaxin in this country. Now the FDA asked uh, uh, the, um, the company that makes Covaxin here to do a trial in, in US and Americans. That trial has been completed and they are going to submit another um, FDA EUA request. So maybe we'll have Covaxin as a whole virus vaccine here. Um, if not, there's seven centers working on a whole virus vaccine, but I think we should use this one. Okay, so to get a virus under control completely, you know, it is unlike measles, which of course only has vaccines, and we actually had, a, had formally eliminated measles in this country, but we've seen some outbreaks with vaccine problems. Um, you, it, it's nice to have both vaccines and therapeutics to really get a virus this transmissible, this, this so everywhere. Um, under control, therapeutics and vaccines. And like pertussis, for example, we have you know, uh, macrolides and vaccines. So I do think the COVID-19 drugs are a big deal. There are two major oral antivirals available. One is molnupiravir, which is, I think of it like AZT. It wasn't made for um, SARS-CoV-2. It was kind of pulled off a shelf, like AZT was pulled off a shelf. Uh, looking at it for Ebola and other uh, RNA viruses, it's a nucleoside analog. And in the MOVE-OUT trial, which was in outpatients who are unvaccinated at risk for severe disease, it decreased hospitalizations and deaths by 30%. So not an amazing, but it did actually work in those who are immunocompromised at a higher level at 50%. This is actually the UK panoramic study of molnupiravir. This is within vaccinated individuals and molnupiravir didn't help. It didn't actually reduce severe disease and death, probably because vaccines work so well and the rate of hospitalization was very low in among vaccinated individuals in this UK study. Paxlovid though, I think is more promising. Paxlovid is a protease inhibitor. So I think of it as indinavir. Um, old protease inhibitor, have to take it with Paxlovid. You have to take it with um, ritonavir. And there were three major trials, EPIC-SR uh, and EPIC-PEP didn't actually work. EPIC-SR is in those who are unvaccinated at standard risk for COVID-19. And PEP is for post-exposure prophylaxis. They both closed. But EPIC-HR were, was a randomized study, Paxlovid versus placebo, in those at high risk for severe disease who are unvaccinated. And Paxlovid was very protective, 89% protective against hospitalization and death. And then you'll say, well, what among what about the uh, vaccinated? Because this is where we are in the world. There's been a lot of vaccinated individuals. There wasn't actually a clinical trial of Paxlovid at, versus not in vaccinated individuals. But I think this is the best observational study that we have 
from Israel that right really tried to control for co-founders. And these are vaccinated individuals. Where did Paxlovid work best in this observational study? Those who are older, 65 and older, at risk for severe disease despite vaccination. And in that case, Paxlovid was very helpful in terms of reducing severe outcomes. And the panoramic study of Paxlovid randomized is um, pending in the UK. And then where are we in terms of new antivirals? I do want to stress that I do think that the mRNA vaccines are very powerful in those living with immunocompromised. We treat people living with HIV. We have done some studies ourselves, but many have done studies that show the mRNA vaccines raise very robust T cell immunity, B cell immunity, even with immunocompromised, the immune system is so redundant. And these vaccines are so powerful that, that studies across immunocompromising conditions show that three doses absolutely are necessary and ongoing booster are very protective against a range of immunocompromise. But this is a very intriguing article that was just published a month ago um, in the New England Journal. This is maybe what's gonna be next. This was a pegylated interferon lambda, giving a dose versus not giving a dose, um, just a single uh, injection and, um, and looked like it essentially reduced either going to the hospital or having to go to the ED by a half if a pegylated interferon lambda was uh, administered in the outpatient setting. I think this is gonna be what's on the horizon. And then I'll end with public health responses and where we are in terms of trust in public health. We are not um, actually at a good place uh, with uh, all of the polarization around this pandemic. No matter what, the strongest predictor of mortality across high-income countries were rates of vaccination. There are very good studies that showed that. High, our high income nation of the United States had one of the lowest vaccination rates compared to other countries by the time the Delta variant hit in July of 2021. We were not where places in Europe were. Um, there are all the societal effects of some of our measures that were used to, um, to try to control the virus and school closures, I think were particularly not only polarizing, but probably uh, not needed um, for such long periods of time in different countries and states. And so what can we do in public health to, to improve misinformation and improve um, vaccine confidence? Because we're going to an era where we're not at the highest level of vaccine confidence. Again, these are those papers. This is um, one in Nature on the top. This is JAMA Network on the bottom that shows the, again, the most important predictor of how countries fared in high income regions, Europe, UK, U.S. was receipt of the vaccine, especially in those 60 years and, and older. This is from uh, uh, across the swath of countries. And then this one in JAMA showed it in the United States, that it was the states with the highest vaccination rates that fared well in Delta. And unfortunately, the states with the lower vaccination rates um, drove our mortality uh, during Delta and at least the first subvariant of Omicron. So let's go back to HIV, and then we'll come back and tie it all together. So in terms of the current state of the HIV pandemic, well, uh, we, as many of us went to Croy, there was a lot of talk about looking back and looking forward. Where have we been and where are we now? And um, you all know, because these were important dates, that June 5th, 1981 was the first CDC report from the MMWR that describe these cases of severe opportunistic infections, KS, CMV, PCP, and mostly young men in our state, in San Francisco, in Miami, in Philadelphia, in New York. And uh, about a month later, a second MMWR uh, reported the severe OIs in young men. So this was a total of about 270 individuals. And if we go through time, in 1981, those 270 individuals described in those two case series, very soon thereafter, 121 had died. That was the case fatality rate of severe um, AIDS, clearly. And by 1982, GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency virus, luckily had been renamed AIDS by the CDC. By 1983 was the first time that a gay couple had ever appeared on the magazine cover of a major US magazine. This is Bobby Campbell, an activist and his partner, Bobby Hilliard, on the face of Newsweek. By 1983, the virus was isolated and we opened our doors. And what I mean by we is Ward 86, the HIV clinic that I serve as medical director, opened its doors in January of 1983. So we celebrated our 40th anniversary a month ago. 
1984, Bobby Campbell had died of AIDS. And 1984 was the year that bathhouses with controversy were closed in San Francisco and New York in an attempt to curb the spread of the virus. By 1985, this is a story in and of itself why it took two years, the first commercial ELISA was approved. In grief, in 1987, there was nothing else, 1987, to do but to just mourn because AZT had not been pulled off that shelf yet from the National Cancer Institute and tried. And it was an era of mourning, and it was an era of grief and expressions of grief. And the Names Project started on Market Street in San Francisco to try to pay homage to all of these people who had died. And the quilt was spread out over the Washington Mall in October of 1987, as shown here. By 1990, because it was that year that a little boy who had acquired HIV from hemophilia blood transfusions in Indiana died from AIDS, and his name was Ryan White. And so it was later that year after he died at the age of 18 that the Bipartisan Act was passed by um, Congress of the Ryan White Care Act. And this is probably one of the most non-controversial things that, the, that, that both sides of Congress pass every time because there has been bipartisan support of the Ryan White Care Program. This is of course um, funds low-income clinics to provide wraparound services, social work, um, and, and kind of multiple services at one site in low-income places, the Ryan White Care Program. By 1992, AIDS was the leading cause of death among U.S. men ages 22 to 44. 1995, there were over 500,000 AIDS cases in the U.S. And then two major initiatives under President Obama was the National HIV AIDS Strategy. And then we're currently sitting in the initiative started under President Trump in 2019 that has continued in the Biden presidency, the End the HIV Initiative. And these are the this is the organizing principle upon how we're trying to combat HIV, four pillars of end the HIV epidemic, diagnose, prevent, treat, and respond to outbreaks. So this is the state of the epidemic, uh, has been a couple of years before data has been, uh, sent, has been gathered by the CDC. So this was a 2019. We all know we're sitting here in California in a higher prevalence. It's always been in the Northeast, but look at, and we all know this, but look at what's happening in the South and Southeast in terms of rising rates of new infections and areas of the country where Medicaid hasn't been expanded, where ADAP isn't there, where sometimes states are refusing federal money like Tennessee. And all of that put together means that virologic suppression rates, which here the lowest rates of virologic suppression are represented by the darker regions, virologic suppression rates are lowest in areas of the country without these services in place um, and, and better in places where, the, where Medicaid has been expanded. HIV is always clustered with poverty, with lack of social justice, with um, incarceration, with everything that's going on in the South and Southeast of our country. This is a map of poverty in the United States. And here's a map of new infections. 52% of the new infections as of the time that we last had data occurred in the South. And among men who have sex with men, the demographic is absolutely shifting towards black and Latino MSM. So um, where are we in the world with HIV? Well, we already talked about the 38.4 million infections uh, of people living with HIV worldwide, but important to note the degree of setbacks that we've had during COVID-19. UN AIDS used to um, put out kind of perky every two years reports like, we're gonna do this or getting better. And unfortunately, in 2022, when UNAIDS put out their report of the current status of the COVID pandemic, of the HIV pandemic, the report was called in danger because of all of the setbacks that occurred with HIV responses during COVID-19. 38.4 million people living with HIV, but 1.5 million new infections in 2021. The trajectories were not supposed to be at 1.5 million new infections. We thought we'd be around 750 to 800,000 new infections um, before the, the COVID pandemic in, in terms of projections. 650,000 deaths last year. That means every minute we've been talking, someone has died of AIDS last year. Um, a uh, ART access, it depends on, on your definition of uh, full or empty. 75% of adults have access to antiretroviral therapy in 2021 and 52% of children have access to antiretroviral therapy. And finally, the 
school closures and everything else was very difficult for adolescent girls and young women. And every two minutes a, in sub-Saharan Africa, an adolescent girl or young woman is diagnosed with HIV. That exacerbated during COVID with school closures and with where else do you go? So let's end with pandemic preparedness and let's end with global equity and where we are as infectious disease researchers, HIV researchers, COVID researchers, what, what are the next steps for not just pandemics, but what are the next steps in terms of, um, of, in terms of advocacy for, for equity? So this was a piece that was published by Barney Graham, who's really the co-discoverer at the Vaccine Research Center at um, the NIH of the mRNA vaccine. And Barney, in fact, I heard this morning, Moderna just had to pay the NIH $400,000. I just saw that in the IDSA uh, reports as I was in the car. So ongoing issues between um, the, the companies and the NIH. But it was a really, I would really refer you to this article in Nature Immunology in 2018, which essentially wrote that vaccines are the mainstay of fighting any pandemic. Maybe not a retrovirus pandemic. We all saw Mosaico results um, at COI. It's been very disappointing and hard to work on an HIV vaccine. Maybe the mRNA HIV vaccines will be hopeful, but at this point, we don't have an effective HIV vaccine. But DNA viruses like MPOX, uh, RNA viruses like COVID, it is there's nothing else but vaccines to combat a pandemic. And it's a very nice perspective to really talk about the emerging technologies, mRNA being one of them, to fight a um, virus. So where are we in the world with um, trust in vaccines, with dissemination of vaccines? We're not um, where we were. And, and a lot contributed to that. But essentially, the WHO and, the UNICEF, and UNICEF has been calling the alarm about the degree of childhood vaccinations that were missed during the COVID pandemic, probably 40, up to 40 million children missed their life-saving vaccines as infants um, around the world for a variety of reasons, closure of medical care, school closures, everything else. And we saw it, but in July of 2022 was our first case of paralytic polio reported in the United States since 2013. This was not a child that had missed vaccine. This was an 18-year-old individual who had never been vaccinated against polio, traveled to Europe, very unlucky, got exposed to an oral polio um, revertant from the vaccine, came back and actually developed oral polio vaccine with subsequent um, a circulation of the polio virus in the wastewater in, in New York. But it really triggered what was happening in New York with the idea that where this individual is from in Rockland County, there's about 60% polio vaccination rates among children. And in some areas, 37% polio vaccination rates, that low among missing infant vaccinations in this country. There was a huge measles outbreak in Zimbabwe that I think didn't get enough attention over the summer. Eight, almost 800 children died. And then there was a, a measles outbreak in Ohio in a daycare. Up to 85 children, all unvaccinated, got quite sick. Uh, from measles, luckily no deaths. And they were all among uh, children who had um, not been vaccinated. So this is where we are with the pandemic. I actually wrote a book. <laughs> it's coming out in July for Mayo Clinic Press to talk about pandemic responses. And our tenets of, of kind of pandemic preparedness is no matter what, it's accelerated vaccinations. That's the key to, to, to um, pandemic preparedness. After that, certainly ease restrictions because by taking away the restrictions that were alienating, okay. capacity limits, uh, masking, um, you can increase trust in the, in the vaccines. Um, we talk about um, uh, sort of discontinuing and kind of a harm reduction approach in terms of schools, encouraging outdoor activities, of course, with respiratory pathogen, schools front and center, children need schools, uh, reopening those first, like UNICEF has been urging the whole time. Um, lockdowns and medical care have led to a lot of um, other cancer diagnoses missed, uh, cardiovascular deaths. So using that in short term only, de-emphasizing anything that doesn't work, deep cleaning never uh, didn't, wasn't needed for COVID, but there are still places that are happening with temperature screens. Um, reassessing testing as you go along and absolutely developing treatment if it's a non-eradicable virus. So that it's treatment and vaccination together uh, in the pandemic response. And then I wanna end just in our last five minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions on 
on um, a history of equity because we are all in the HIV world. And what we saw with the COVID vaccine echoed way, way too, resonated way too much with what had happened with antiretroviral treatment access. So what was happening with ART access worldwide is that in partially in response to this, there was something that was developed by the World Trade Organization in 1995, this should be WTO, called the TRIPS Agreement. And TRIPS meant that if you're in the middle of a global pandemic, it's not the time to argue about patents. This is the time to essentially invoke waivers of patents and disseminate that life-saving modality worldwide. This was always, in, well, for a long time in place to be invoked for just this emergency like COVID-19. And um, partially that was in response to the fact that all these highly active antiretroviral agents had been developed um, in, in 1996 and Europe and the US were getting these advances, but the places where HIV was worst in Eastern Southern Africa had no access to antiretroviral therapy. It was profoundly unfair. In 2001, just as a comment, I wrote a piece in time about this, I didn't realize this, but Pfizer had made $1 billion just from fluconazole, life-saving cryptococcal meningitis, only treatment for cryptococcal meningitis, because they wouldn't take it off patent, a billion dollars that year alone in 2001. So you all know the history, but it was partially India that helped make antiretroviral access uh, more disseminated around the planet. In 2001, not even invoking the TRIPS waiver because there were too many arguments from high-income countries, India, pharmaceutical companies in India made antiretroviral therapy in one pill for less than a dollar a day and started selling it everywhere, including South Africa. You may not have known that pharmaceutical companies sued South Africa in 2001 saying you can't have these cheap therapies. It was so um, distasteful that they would do that. It was so terrible on a worldwide sca uh, scale that it was actually us, HIV advocates, the HIV community that said, are you kidding? And stopped that lawsuit and stopped that, um, that sort of greed by the pharmaceutical companies and the dissemination of antiretroviral access from India continued. So the, um, and now we're in the state of the world where 18.2 million doses of ART therapy are provided by the PEPFAR program worldwide. But again, still lack of access in a certain proportion of the population in adults and children. So uh, the reason I find that very ironic, it was actually India and South Africa that advocated in October of 2020 with the World Trade Organization to invoke the TRIPS waiver. In fact, what happened is right before the Delta variant really devastated India because it was identified from around there and, and there was very low immunity in the population. There was only a 4% vaccination rate. And the Delta variant was terrible in India in March of 2021. But the history was that in October 2020, India and South Africa had gone to the WTO and said, we anticipate that we've done well so far. There could be you know, another variant. It could get very bad here. We need access to these vaccines. Let us make these vaccines in our countries. Let India make vaccines for the rest of the world. And they said no. And in fact, the pharmaceutical companies, when Biden was elected as president in January 2021, wrote him a letter and said, did you see that appeal from India and South Africa? Ugh, ignore that. That is something we're going to ignore. And no, Biden and, and the United States did not advocate in, a, in, a, in enough of a way to, to um to work on um, global equity. And it was very limited. And we all saw what happened uh, with this lack of global equity to vaccines in India and other places of the world. And so this is where we are worldwide. This is data as of last night, seven, almost 70% of the population in this planet has received one dose of the COVID vaccine. There have been 13.31 billion doses disseminated worldwide. But to only 27.6% of those in low-income countries have received the vaccine. And yes, there has been global, there has been more hesitancy in recent months in, in getting the vaccine in low-income countries, but that was partially because it, I think wasn't made available early on and in, and in large quantities. And so I think what we just saw from pandemics is ART access should have alerted us that of course, global 
equity is important. The MPOX vaccine did a great job, right, with disseminating it. But guess where it didn't go? It was endemic areas in Western Central Africa of MPOX. And then we saw what played out with the COVID vaccine. And I do think it's our job. It is our job in our community to, um, like we did in 2000 and um, uh, in the early 2000s with um, ART access to advocate for global equity. So I'll end there. And we do have time for questions. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi, for that excellent uh, presentation overview of a few things. Um, I think we're waiting for a few questions to, to come in, but I'll, I guess I will ask the first one. Um, so a common question that I'm you know, seeing in my practice, people are asking, well, I've had all my boosters. Uh, you know, so they've had total, of, I think, five shots, right? And so the question is, in the future, do you anticipate uh, for our HIV folks, will they require a yearly or or will they fit under a different category where they may need more boosters more frequently? Well, I think that's a great question because people with HIV, um, really, they're, they're very different. So it's actually those who have low CD4 counts, less than 200, and non-virologic suppression that have been shown in these multiple studies to not respond as well to the vaccine, to require these booster vaccinations. So just like the MPOC study that we saw over uh, Croy and was published in the Lancet, it is those with immunosuppression that we must worry about most that happened with MPOX, and that's that's true of COVID. So I think the yearly vaccines will most likely uh, absolutely be recommended for people with HIV, especially those with CD4 counts less than 200. I doubt we'll be in a situation where we'll require more than one dose a year. That was, I think, peculiar to the first three years of the pandemic. Um, I don't I'm not sure. We'll have to see how the United States goes with that. I'll tell you what's happening in the UK. In the UK, essentially, um, the UK has actually stopped the booster campaign um, for anyone less than 50 as of February 12th, 2023. They said, you don't need it. And those who are 65 and older qualify for a booster only. So I'm going to open it up here for our in-person audience to see if there are any uh, questions. I just wanted to sort of comment. I think the the global equity issue is just so poignant here. And one of the things in the early days of the Genios um, vaccine that just horrified me was we had tens of thousands of doses of Genios expiring right. in our national stockpile. And yet there's endemic monkeypox and trials could have been ongoing. It's and it's just, been endemic monkeypox yes. has been there since since fundamentally since we stopped the mass right. smallpox vaccination right. program so the 80s yeah. i mean yeah i mean actually stopped in africa in in 1979 here in the early 70s yeah. and it it's as if that didn't exist it's as if we saw mpox yeah. for the first time and you're right we give the genius vaccine we give smallpox vaccination to the military so we had massive amounts of stock uh, stockpiles and 20 million doses had just expired yeah. when the global outbreak occurred it was so Tragic. It, to this day, though, uh, Western Central Africa has not received Genius vaccine. Uh, we're in, you know, March it, of 2023. It just astonishes me that so many of these, you know, epidemic diseases are global, obviously. We and so we keep doing, doing the same it over thing. And over. I know it's 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 it's. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know how to address that. I, I and but you know, one thing I will say is that it was us. It was the HIV community this, that in 2000 marched in Durban and said, I'm doing fine in US and Europe. I have my, back, and I'm not gonna take my medication until, I, until people in South Africa have access. This was always the history of our community. And I think we, we need to do that for COVID and, and MPOX. All right, there uh, looks like there's a question from Nettie Aldis. Uh, curious to hear from the ID crowd, what strategies uh, folks are using for coordinated advocacy for inequity and access? Yes, I mean, it's really interesting that you ask that because I haven't seen the same level of advocacy occurring in the ID community during the COVID pandemic than I saw with HIV. Um, who really advocated the most? The World Health Organization. They were horrified when boosters started being rolled out in high-income nations when low-income nations had not even received their first dose. They absolutely put out document after document, speech after speech, that this is massively unfair. And in their latest pandemic 
treaty, which covers sort of future pandemics, there's a there's a front and center um, focus on global equity. But uh, the ID community uh, did I I, don't, I didn't see them advocate in the same way. Maybe because in HIV, it was such a history of activism, and COVID became so polarized and. Um, we are not in a good place in the ID community. I think you know this, but the ID match rate last year, last match in this country, we didn't fill 44% of our um, slots. Dr. Fauci came in with security detail to Croy the other day. Uh, people are, um, yesterday, the Supreme Court in California is, is thinking about child, reevaluating childhood vaccinations. We are not in a good place in this country with how people feel about ID and we got to work on it. We have to work on public health trust. We have to work on coming together as a community. I'm just curious, this was brought up at Croy in a couple of talks, but what, I don't mean to point fingers, but I'm gonna, um, how, how, I want the CDC to do a better job <laughs> with I, a cohesive, intelligent, scientific message. In fact, the how CDC, do we get there? yeah, so the CDC's current trust you know, how many people trust the CDC? Mar large Gallup poll, 32% of Americans trust the CDC. And this is not divided along Republican and Democratic lines. And um, and Rochelle Walensky did speak at the opening session, the new investigator session at Croy, um, and addressed this somewhat. But the, but the messaging has been so, so confusing. A uh, 12-year-old is the same as an 80-year-old in terms of risk of COVID, in inaccurate. Um, masking uh, guidance, very inaccurate, very confusing. And you know what they did in Denmark? Um, I just keep, I wrote this book partially to address the U.S. response to the COVID pandemic because I thought it was very political both ways. And in Denmark, what they did was this. They opened schools early because they saw that children were less at risk. And in fact, the Denmark prime minister apologized to the Denmark public in um in spring of 2020, they said, he said, I'm so sorry that we kept them closed for six weeks. Okay, <laughs> then <laughs> then, um, then, when they rolled out the, the COVID vaccine, they said, you know what, get the vaccine and life goes back to normal. It doesn't, it, we don't do endless restrictions and masking and boosters, just life goes back to normal. So 85% of their population took the vaccine and they went back to normal in December, 2021. And they've been, or sorry, 20, I think it was in March of, 2021, and they've been living normally since. There's this kind of thing we did here where, and you know this, but the blue states were like, we're never going back to normal. The red states went back to normal way before the vaccines. There's just, we were so polarized. We were so political and the CDC did not help under both administrations. If we do not work on CDC trust, Michelle Walensky talked about this, they will, they will cut funding for the CDC, Congress will. And she is advocating for, for increased funding, but that's not falling on happy ears in, in Congress at the moment. As we speak, Dr. Fauci is in Congress, like talking about, about research. We are in a, this is what I mean. The CDC did not, did not help us. I don't know how to change that, but I do think it's about messaging and cleanness and not having politics so involved in the CDC. So we've got, Quite a few comments. Okay. Know that we're well, yeah, I went into COVID three. and I went into politics, so there is going to be comments. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, but you you had kind of just mentioned a little bit about masking. So there was one question. Uh, so patients keep asking me to take off their mask. Uh, what's the data on effectiveness of masking? Is there any data uh, on if mixed messaging on masking early on contributed to uh, public mistrust? I mean, if you're going to ask me, I have a really strong opinion on it. I actually wrote about this in Endemic. I think that we should have said, just like in HIV, get the treatments, life goes back to normal. And I think we should have said, the vaccines are here, life goes back to normal. And this is not normal to be masking. In addition, the Cochrane, and I wrote about this in this book, and in the Cochrane Review, and we can't deny this review, uh, this was published about three weeks ago, really looked at RCTs, looked at observational studies of masking, we all know what Cochrane does. It tries to put all the data together, and there didn't seem to be a massive impact on population-level masking with control of COVID-19, and it wasn't just performed in the pre-COVID era. They looked at the Bangladesh randomized control trial. They looked at the Dan Mass study, and there were randomized control studies of masking performed in this pandemic. I think that we should go back in healthcare. I mean, you asked me, 
I think we should go back in healthcare to masking with people in front of COVID, but I think it hinders communication. I think it, people want to see their doctor's faces, and I think we should stop eliminate. We should eliminate universal masking in healthcare. Great. Uh, two quick questions. Two quick questions. Uh, could you comment on the impact of the non-for-profit AstraZeneca vaccine? Yes, I think the non-for-profit AstraZeneca vaccine was amazing. I think they, they, the Oxford Group made this vaccine so cheap, available worldwide, places in South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, places in Latin America, places across Europe got AstraZeneca. I think it's a great vaccine. I think it's an underappreciated vaccine. It, re it really has a very good T-cell response. It, it was all over India, and India after Delta did really well with the Covaxin and AstraZeneca. I think it's a great vaccine. I think it's the most in incredible example of global vaccine equity that we had was that AstraZeneca vaccine. All right. Uh, and last question, are there uh, national efforts to evaluate social media's effect on the spread of disease? Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I, I thought about this a lot, um, a lot. So, so remember early on in HIV, we had some very strange ideas like HIV doesn't cause AIDS, but those ideas were not disseminated massively. They really weren't like Peter Duesberg at Berkeley and, and Becky and South Africa. They, they got to change because it wasn't actually true. But now what happens is someone can say that the COVID vaccines are killing young people in droves and they're all dropping dead. And that can absolutely be disseminated across millions of people on social media with one click. And since Elon Musk took over Twitter, if you look on the right side, what's trending, it's vaccines kill, Pfizer lied, um, Jamal, sorry, the football player. Uh, and, and, and it has been bad because it is misinformation. And yet some of the misinformation control by the government has also been really polarizing. I will tell you what I think is this. I gave a talk for the FDA two weeks ago on the COVID vaccines, and I gave them kind of this talk, and I sent it to them, and they said, no, we want you to talk about adverse events. We want you to bring in the M word. So I brought in myocarditis, and I talked about nuance, and I talked about, like, who needs to be boosted, and there were 450 people on the call, and they said, we can't even talk about nuance because the other side is so anti-vaccine and says that everyone's dying. But if we don't talk about nuance, we will be blamed by not talking about nuance. So they do have to talk about nuance. So we are in a, just an awful place with social media, and I am really worried because what I really want to stress is the Barney Graham article. There's nothing else to combat a vaccine, but a, a pandemic, but a vaccine. Next time, if there is a new pandemic, we will pull out mRNA technology and we will immediately make a vaccine. It will be mRNA. And we have to reduce that, that polarization around mRNA technology because they're great vaccines. Sorry, I don't know how to fix all these problems that we're having. <laughs> well, on that happy note, uh, we, <laughs> we will close today's round. Certainly wanted to thank Dr. Monica Gandhi for an excellent and provocative talk uh, today. Uh, and uh, before we leave, uh, Marvin has a few words uh, to say a little bit about our CME process. So. Thank you. So for those who are still online and everyone in the room, if you're looking, going starting next Friday, if you need CME credit, um, we have switched over to the new system at UCSD. So every regular scheduled series at UCSD is eventually going to be moved over to this cloud CME um, centralized system. So you only need to, I sent two emails last week. You only need to create a profile if you need CME credit. Um, all presenters and will also have to file disclosures through the cloud CME. You'll get your transcripts through cloud CME. Um, so most of it will be through cloud CME versus me, <laughs> which is nice for me. <laughs> but um, so, and then for check-ins, the check-in will be via attendance or via text. So I'll be sending out an email about how to do that, how to set up your one time, like to, to sync your cell phone with the cloud CME. Then you just text a unique code every week, which will be sent out in the meeting announcements. Um, and I think that's it for now. So if you have any questions, please email me. But next week, we're starting the new system for, for all those needing CME units. Thank you. All right. So that ends uh, today's uh, rounds. Uh, in the next few coming uh, rounds coming up, uh, we will be having our CROI updates uh, coming up. So hope to see you then. Thank you.